It's Daybreak on Trust Television. Now, we'll take a look at our first discussion. Nigeria appears to be on another critical juncture, preparing to ascend another transition of power, a huddle that requires more rigorous and preparedness. But like every other election season, the stakes are high. Tension abounds and uncertainty is also in abundance. It is this uncertainty that has now given rise to concerns and worries whether the 2023 presidential election will be conducted smoothly. Unlike the previous election, this appeared to be a three or, if you like, a four-horse race. Uh, Bola Tinubu of the APC, Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party, not forgetting Rabiu Musa Kwamkoso of the NNPP. What are the factors that may shape the outcome of the election? We have in the studio uh, two gentlemen to make clear or to give us more perspectives on this. Uh, one, a member of the APC, Honorable Danjuma Mohammed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we also have a chieftain of the PDP, Umar Sani, uh, in the studio. Thank you uh, for coming on Daybreak. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Uh, let me begin uh, with you. Uh, Madam Omar, I mean, in 20, February 2023, Nigerians will be going to the polls. And um, ahead of that, a lot of promises are in the air uh, right now. But for many Nigerians, some of these promises are not new. They're old promises, you know, but with little, very, very little uh, implementation uh, sometimes. So why should Nigerians be considering your candidate and not the others? as the person that can deliver on what they say they will do? Well, uh, promises are promises and people have made promises. Now, we are not a political party that are noted for making false promises. Because even when we handed over in 2015, Nigerians recall our governance with nostalgia. Nigerians know that the PDP is a talk and do political party. And so uh, from 1999 to 2015 when we lost power, the PDP has done a lot. But that is beside the point. My candidate was part of that a lot that was done between 1999 to 2015. However, if you segregate his, his tenure with President Olusegun Obasanjo between 1999 to 2007, you will discover that the country had gone to a higher trajectory in terms of the, our growth in GDP, our growth in the, uh, attracting foreign direct investment, our growth in, in form of uh, uh, debt cancellation and debt relief, our growth in technology. Our, so we, during that period, and he was also the the, ch the chairman of the National e uh, Economic Council. Uh, so he was part and parcel of uh, that period. And within that period, Nigeria didn't witness any form of terrible insecurity and so forth and so on. Yeah. So look, taking a cue from that perspective and bringing it to what is he has promised this time around. Uh, but at that, in those times, uh, he was what is now known as a spare tire, a vice president. No, well, he, uh, so the issue is now that the onus is going to be on him. If he wins, can he be trusted? That's well, the big question. The that first thing I would say is there is nothing like a spare tire. There is only one mandate. The president and the vice president are one mandate, and they work together. And every, every achievement that is done by one is done by all. So there is nothing like a spare tire. He was part and parcel of the government. He participated actively and he was part of the decision. Okay. That right. it. Um, Honorable Mohammed. Yes, yes. <clears throat> You're of the APC. Yes. Your party has been in power now for the past seven years. By next year it would be in power, it would have been in power for eight years. Okay. In these seven years, would you say that the party has given an account, a good account of itself, so much so that it should be considered in 2023? Excellently, even beyond the expectation of ordinary Nigerians. Not minding the fact that there are some kind of, um, you know, propaganda against what government is doing. Number one, 
when we came to power in, 19, in 2015, we met seven non-performing rice mills in Nigeria. And today we have about 71 performing rice mills in Nigeria and still counting. And today our rice production stands at 7 million metric tons. And you know, this is an achievement that ordinarily was never recorded. In fact, 25 years before we came into mm. power. But if you talk about that, you yes. have people buying, you know, rice now at more exorbitant prices it is than understandable it was ever. And exactly. So ex let me has explain. the goal been let achieved? Me, it has been achieved. I will explain. You see, the ECOWAS protocol of free movement of goods and services within ECOWAS member, member nation borders has created a problem for Nigeria. It has expanded our local market. Our local market before that protocol was ordinarily confined within the borders of this country. We had 200 million people, you know, in our local market. But unfortunately, you see, Chad, Cameroon, Beni Republic, Niger, and uh, which other country is the fifth? Togo have become integral part of Nigeria's local market. This is where the problem is. So if at, if at all we need, say, like six million metric tons production or no of paddy to a kind of to saturate our local market and meet local demand now we have up to 15 million to do that but so it is tasking but what should be your inquest as members of the fourth estate of the realm is if this had been on from 1999 till date we would have been talking about in fact 30 million metric tons of But rice. even with the achievements that you mentioned... This, just, this is just a few. Yes, hey, I yes and that's why I'm taking you mm. up on it. Mm. Even with the achievements that you mentioned mm. in the rice yes, sector, yes. There's still, uh, the, the price of rice is not uh, affordable, as yes, it were, yes. and they still talk about hunger in the land. Excellent. The British Prime Minister in your own news gave answers to that. APC was not in Wuhan in China when Corona came in. Coronavirus actually took more tolls, people don't know this, on international economies than on human lives. Since then, the best, I mean, the strongest world economies have permanently, US particularly, British economy have permanently remained on the brink of economic recession. So it's not been easy at all. In fact, in fact, for this very factor of trying to localize production in Nigeria, which, which was the first time in over 30 years by our administration, Nigeria will have been worse than what it is today. Come to think of it, the rice that we imported consistently over 16, or under 16 years of PDP's rule from Thailand, by the time you exchange what you have today in terms of the value of the Nigerian Naira and the dollars to import from Thailand, you'll be buying that bag of rice, not at 40, or 30 something thousand naira, but at 150 thousand naira. Okay. So the issue of hunger will have been more severe than this. Economies have failed under this corona propelled global inflation. Nigeria is a part, it's an integral part of the global economy. So you do not expect Nigeria to be exempted. How, how, the only questions that should come from you is what are we doing? How, what is our government the doing impact to push is the more on some countries than in others. Exactly. That so, is just so that's where I'm going now, Madam uh, Umar, if you may. Uh, <clears throat> we have heard so much about how COVID-19, the Russia-Ukraine war has impacted on our economy so that we are doing so badly and we are recording the high levels of inflation that we have uh, right now. So what's your candidate going to do differently to ensure that our economy has some kind of shockers such that the impact will not be that much on our economy, even when this global, uh, uh, well, I won't call them accidents, but uncertainties, you know, come up. Well, let me first and foremost, I would prefer to set the record straight before I come to respond to your question. Uh, as at the time the PDP was in power, I happened to be part of the government, so I am very much conversant with uh, the efforts made by Akimumi Adeshina, the president, uh, president of the African Development Bank in terms of agricultural revolution in Nigeria. Uh, to say that there was only one 
non-functional rice meal. I said seven, not one. Uh, it's, I it's, said less than seven uh, non It's not correct. Because I was part of a delegation that went to KB State to commission 26 rice mills. Functional 26 rice mills in KB State alone. We also went to Taraba. An American company had rice mills in Taraba, which we went to commission. So it is not correct. And again, coming to the issue of rice uh, importation, the, the consumption at that time was about 1.1, 1.2 trillion metric tons of rice in the country. And Nigeria was producing about 800 million metric tons. Given the balance is what is being what what was imported uh, within the economy at that time, and that was why it it struck a balance, and there was abundance of rice at affordable prices. You know, forget about if we are talking about you know taking a tour. We have more uh, ports in Benin Republic where people go there to to you know to discharge some of their goods. So it is there is there is the probability that rice will even be much more cheaper in Benin Republic than even in Nigeria. So take, taking a holistic look at the West African market will not give the proper perspective. Having said this, I will now come to your issue. My candidate has looked at all the issues he has on board, and he has called them UCIT. One, he will unify the country, which is the U. The, secondly, he will tackle the issue of insecurity, which is the S. The E is he will tackle educational backwardness and bring it to the fore. Number four, the E, other E, is for the economy. He will deal decisively with the economy. And then the, the, the D, the, which is, the, 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 is the, for development. And development means, you know, restructuring, you know, of the, 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 the country, so that it will be functional and it will be m much more productive in terms of all other administrative or, uh, issues that would likely arise due to people's uh, agitation, it's especially you know, place, places where you have people who are uh, engrossed in self-determination issues like uh, the, the Biafra Yeah, but we are talking movement. about self-sufficiency. We are talking about how can Nigeria be self-sufficient, self-sufficient in such a way that uh, you do not have the high levels of impact that the you know, global forces is having the, in, in, on the economy right now. Yeah. The issue of the Russia-Ukraine and the issue of COVID-19 pandemic. That's, that's what we are looking at. What, should, what would your candidate be doing to ensure that Nigeria's economy, you know, attain that at least to a, a good level of self-sufficiency. You know, he is an international business person, and he has promised, you know, to ensure that he, there will be, you know, direct foreign investment into Nigeria, you know, which will now surpass what we are witnessing due to the, the high level of insecurity, where investors are now fleeing outside the country. And so w there is no much investment that can lead to what others are saying, a, co a productive uh, economy rather than a consumptive economy. Now, uh, the, gov the governor of Kaduna State has made some uh, allusions so just recently that most of the people who have come to make investments have run away from Kaduna State in view of the security challenge. Mm -hmm. So if we tackle the security challenge and we bring in more investments into the country, we are sure that the, the economy will, will, will get the needed boost that will now ease life, you know, throw away hunger and make Nigerians, you know, excited more one, once again. All right, Honorable Mohammed. Yes, you I talked about it. you talked about rice, yes. and then uh, the major problem in Nigeria today is mm. insecurity, yes. which has also forced some people, some farmers, mm. to flee their farms, exactly. including the rice farmers. Exactly. Now, Nigerians are bemoaning the insecurity situation at the moment. Your party is currently in power. Mm. What is it going to do differently if re-elected? 
You see, before I come to that question, I still want to say that I stand by my earlier claim that we had less than seven non-performing rice mills in Nigeria. The idea with me, the IQ with me, somebody you talked about, actually, yes, initiated the Olam project, which is very, very, that is a big time foreign investment in the Nigerian rice, um, 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 you know, production, uh, uh, I mean, activities. But the truth of the matter is that, as at the time they left government, the 94% of rice we consume in Nigeria were from Thailand. It's on record. So, I mean, having said that, I want to go to now address this. You see, we inherited a nation at war with the insurgents, a nation in which 17 local governments were controlled by the insurgents. Flags were hoisted, insurgents that were propelled and by a twisted religious ideology. Unfortunately, a government that claimed, or rather a political party that claimed to love Nigeria, that PDP was in government, but allowed the insurgents so much room to build, you know, you know, you know, you know, its base in the northeastern part of Nigeria. But well, that, that is now history. We came in and showed that the first thing was to fight headlong, to rescue and take back our territories. Well, but why taking that back Medjugorje from the insurgents? Yes. We had banditry going on into that other is, parts that of the is, country. That we is had the agitations for that is exactly. other agitations you see, you see, in other you see, parts. You see, you see, you have this thing, that is the metamorphosis of a diminishing insurgency. They have been diminished. They have been so a kind of, you know, dealt with in a way that you are no longer at risk of seeing you know, the bombardment of the United Nations building here in Abuja, the, the, you, know, the, the, you, know, the, you know, car bombs in Kano in places. Can we really make that claim? Well, no, we no, really excuse make me, that excuse claim me. In, I will the, come in the there. wake of the attack on yes. Kuje prison, yes. where hundreds of prisoners were freed, including terrorists, can we really make that claim? That, that was, where we have that schools was shutting a, down on the me, account of me, insecurity? Excuse, excuse me, excuse me. That is a professional failure on the part of those who are to a kind of secure the prisons. That was a, a jailbreak. Who are, it under, wasn't the first, who are under the leadership uh, of your party? Not really, no, I, no, I accept. Even the president accepted when he went there, he accepted that there was a failure of intelligence. All I'm trying to say is that it wasn't the first time you had jailbreak in Nigeria. And it was, that was the first time under our government we had this. But we've, we've seen the highest number of jailbreaks in the last two years under your administration. I the mean, highest? Uh, yeah. Excuse me, where did you put within the, the, two, within the last two years? No, we've, no, seen, no, no. we've seen at least at least 15 jailbreaks. I, well, I don't, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't know of this you're talking about. To talk but when you're talking about, excuse me, when you're talking about the jailbreak at Kuji, I'm only saying that even the president owned up to the fact that there was failure of intelligence. And I'm saying that jailbreak isn't exclusively, you know, a kind of done under this regime. It happened under previous regimes too, but it's all part of the work ongoing to ensure that you have internal security. But I'm only telling you to respond to the questions about security. What I'm saying is that, look, in the entire world, there is no, not even the United States, in the United States of America can come to lay claim to say it has gotten, it has achieved 100% you know, a kind of success over terrorism, international terrorism. What we had with Boko Haram, Boko Haram eventually linked up because of the carelessness of those who were at the hands of affairs. Then we had this, it was an ordinary radical religious group in Maiduguri, but because of the extrajudicial killing of their leader, Mohammed Yusuf, before you knew it, it snowballed into an international terrorist insurgency against Nigeria. We made sure that they were decimated to the point that they can no longer launch such attack. But unfortunately, such you know, armed struggle criminality has a way of metamorphosing into banditry and kidnapping. You know, that is the commercial aspect of it. If you recall, go back to history, the first robbery in Nigeria committed by Dr. Oyenusi came immediately after the Nigerian Civil War. What happened? Because of the arms, using the civil war, found its ways into the hands of criminals. So what you see seeing in terms of banditry, kidnapping, even though I want to say that kidnapping, well, maybe on the lighter mood, kidnapping itself was introduced at executive level by the PDP, when Ngigi, sitting governor, 
was kidnapped in a number of states. But I haven't said that. I mean, that's just on a lighter mood. But what you see about banditry and kidnapping are nothing but the effects of the diminishing of terrorism in the Northeast. All right. It is not. It is not. It is not only we are doing. We have done so much on it. Well, you know, only about two days ago there was a security alert, or three days ago, by the U.S. Mm. The, the government mm. uh, embassy, the U.K. government mm. uh, embassy, and even the Canadian embassy mm. Mm. of these people regrouping. Mm. In fact, even in the FCT. So, will you really? They say have not done as much as, as Nigeria has done against the terrorists. I can tell you this. The best American government has done against terrorism is to kill Osama bin Laden. We killed Abu Bakr Shikau. He's no longer living, but that is not it. The problem is not to have allowed it, to have nipped it in the bud. That was the opportunity PDP missed. All and right. that was why PDP has had tried. seven years, though. Yeah, exactly, so but we have done very well. We have done very well in tackling insurgency. Go to the Northeast. It is not the same Northeast, Northeast we inherited from the PDP. But, but, the, but talking about the, banditry and kidnapping is inevitable because you, it has to metamorphose. That too has uh, been tackled. He's been, uh, he's been tackled right. he headlong. All right, I mean, uh, let's go to uh, mm. Madam Umar. I mean, Nigeria, by its passing day, seemed to be losing uh, its monopoly over the use of force in the country, uh, owing to the fact that you have more people with arms in their hands right now. And uh, the issue of insecurity appears to be insurmountable. Sometimes we have to negotiate, you know, with this terrorist and all of that. And, you know, it's looking more and more hopeless on all of that. What would your candidate do differently to address this issue? Proliferation of arms is almost at the highest level right now. The borders are so porous and the, and the rest of them. Uh, well, like uh, uh, my, my colleague has mentioned, perhaps, you know, we tend to forget history so quickly and that we give it a new coloration because we want to save face or save our party from embarrassment. Now, we all know that the emergence of Boko Haram was principally because they wanted to, to create a caliphate in the uh, Northeast. And that certain things propelled them into that. And they started with different strategies. One of their strategy was to create a chain of command where you have the Abu Kaka, who is the spokesperson, you have the Shekau, who is the head, and so forth and so on. And as time went by, once they try a system and it does not work, they change into another system. And so the system came to be that terror must be spread across the country. And so they targeted certain places where they were supposed to, to, so to send those warning signals as terror. Now, having looked at it from that, one of the campaign promises that uh, the uh, APC presidential candidate then, you know, President Mohamed Buhari now, said was that he was going to leave from the front. And that within six months, he will be able to wipe away this insurgency. Now, uh, don't forget that at the time this insurgency started, it was a new phenomenon. And our security agencies were not trained to contain guerrilla warfare. They, were, they are used to the normal you know, conventional warfare where it takes sides. Now, this was a new phenomenon, and so we were looking for solutions to it. And we were able to hold elections successfully in the whole state. So if there were any other state that people, or any domain which was held by terrorists, elections were held in almost every place of the, of the country. So that alone means we handed over a, you know, average least, you know, secured country. Now coming to uh, the, the APC, there was a multidimensional spread of the whole thing. One headsman came up. Alaji Omar. Let me uh, let me learn, please. No, the thing is. This. No, I have to learn because it 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 gives it ha it has to give a correlation to the whole argument. Number two, uh, bandits came in. Number three, uh, 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 
IPOP and ECN came in. So there was total spread of insecurity in the country. You know, we have been able to suppress militancy in the Niger Delta. And so the, 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 as it is now, the fear is not even about uh, the issues of insecurity. It's even how to even tra traverse from one place to another. For instance, I stay in Kaduna. I am not confident that I can go to Kaduna successfully and in, in good light. So the, the, does it mean that insecurity has been tamed? Definitely not. So, you know, the proliferation of light and small arms definitely started, we all know, from the Gaddafi era, after the, 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 uh, his overthrow, you know, and people were, had access to these small uh, light arms and came, you know, and surrounded the West African territories okay. to pursue their own part, uh, personal ambition. Alajuma, yeah. all the things you mentioned, Nigerians are aware. And that is why Nigerians want something to, to change. So the question is, seeing that your party has noted all of this, mm. what is it going to do to change it? And it's not enough to say, I'm going to tackle insecurity, because we've seen that every uh, candidate is saying the same thing. How is it going to uh, do that? What is it going to do differently? Well, uh, insecurity, the way to tackle insecurity you know, you have to take a two-pronged approach. One, which we call the carrot and stick approach. Now, which is to look for soft landing, soft way of making these insurgents see reason and abandon uh, their, their, uh, their terror, terrorist activities. And the other one is to have, you know, military engagement to be able to resolve this matter. Now, in having this military engagement, of course, what has been missing is obeying the rules of engagement. And we will tackle it in this approach to ensure that Nigerians will sleep with their two eyes closed. So we will, we will give them some, some incentives. If you stop this, you can come on. Just the way we, we, we resolved in the military. To, to, to the uh, terrorists. We have seen uh, uh, states where they gave this thing, maybe amnesty or as it were, and these people went back. They said, uh, if you listen to the terrorists, they said that it was a great gift. They were given something with the left hand and collected with the right hand. Now, there has to be sincerity of purpose when you are doing this type of things. Now, what, don't forget what El Adwa achieved with the militancy. Without firing a bullet, he was able to tame the militants, give them amnesty, you know, opened an amnesty office, it brought a ministry for Niger Delta. You know, so many things were done to assuage them, which has made them to stop the militancy. But and we, so, we, and yet, yet, yet we have a very high level of oil theft right now that we are dealing with. So, uh, in in other way, the issue is not being sorted. Well, uh, you well, know, well that, the the issue of the oil theft, which I'm sure even your your station has done a documentary on it, you know, is largely the the youths in the Niger Delta are complaining that there is no employment for them. There is so you know and from the statistics from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that there is high level, about 33% of employable Nigerians are unemployed. And so those people are saying, we cannot be employed, we, nobody, we have our degrees. So the problem cuts across you know, the, the length and breadth of the country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes I'm, I'm skeptical about the way we treat you know, terrorists and bandits and criminals and all that. We, we say we want to negotiate, we want to give them soft landing, we want to declare amnesty. At the risk of you know, resorting to maybe what you, you may consider as maybe romancing the criminals or maybe a kind of encouraging people to take up arms or to be violent about their agitations and the rest of them. Does that really solve the problem? No, it's, it's it, that, you know, when you are looking, this, don't forget that these criminals are our citizens. It is the responsibility of government to reform recalcitrant citizens. And so if government is charged with that responsibility, 
government cannot you know refuse to look at these okay. issues dispassionately and be able to address it squarely okay. so you you either address it in a, with a military fiat or you use all right that suffice okay. now at the end of the day you need you need money to do all the things that you are promising as a political party now we have a problem of you know budget deficit that we're dealing with a very high debt you know debt ratio uh, our debt to income ratio is not commensurable you know and all of that how do you generate money and then how do you block leakages to ensure that you are able to implement all that you are promising to do now before i come to that question i should tell you what my candidate intend to do about insecurity differently um taking I into consideration the fact that it's your party exactly that's exactly right exactly now. first is a continuity of the intensity of military approach laid down by President Buhari. Now, Aswaju Ahmed Tinubu has equally promised that number one is to address the chronic issues of un unemployment in Nigeria by way of taking millions of Nigerian youths out of the streets of varying you know, academic qualifications into Expanding talking Excuse about me. talking Military. about those Nigeria youth. Yeah, exactly. we, we have a recent uh, a current syndrome, the Jaguar syndrome, yes. where a lot of youth who have uh, they do not have a lot of confidence in the system anymore mm. are struggling to get out of the country yes. because of this unemployment. Mm. So it's uh, this this issue of you know Jaguar is another word for brain drain. This has been on. For years not as now. much as we have it now. exactly yes because 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 the economy is growing under the pressure of global inflation naturally they too do not know that where they intend to go uh, even facing worse scenarios i mean a week or two weeks ago there was a release of of, of countries that uh, you know was hit by higher cost of living about 10 countries nigeria isn't one of them as worse as you think that our country is, we are still not one of them. But that aside, but I am saying that unemployment has created a lot of army for both insurgents, kidnappers, and bandits. So what first he, as Raj Bola Ametinbu intends to do, is to take millions of Nigerian youths as a priority, use them to expand the capacity, personnel capacity, of Nigerian army, Nigerian navy, Nigerian air force, um, um, a, a how paramilitary. Do you, how do you do that with the, the funds? The, how yes, do the you fund, do that? The, this we is do simple. Have the money. Yes, this is simple. You see, we, if, if you look at it, we embarked on massive infrastructural projects in, in the last seven years. Now, all you need to do is to prune down your capital expenditure because we have a situation at hand. Don't forget that in the last 16 years, during the period of the PDP government of um, um, uh, Obasanjo Atiku, national companies, but when I say national, companies owned by Nigeria as a government were sold. And unfortunately, even up till today, nobody knows the impute, the contribution of these companies to the economy in terms of employment, in, fact, in terms of even fiscal you know, remittances. But having that is, that is aside, I'm only giving kind of background to what policies in the past, you know, it kind of produced the magnitude of this current, the current unemployment. So you are talking about the salary. This is simple. All you need to do is you prune down your capital expenditure. And also... Which, which uh, is debatable, I mean, at the moment, we've not seen no, it demonstrated on no, the, excuse me, the last excuse seven me, and a half years. Me, so, excuse, again, excuse it leaves excuse, a lot of no, doubt. It's a, it's a matter of priority. Was it not priority the that made... report, for instance, is gathering dust, which, you know, which, 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 which is recommending the pruning that you are talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Pruning yes. of years. Yes, exactly. So, no, I mean, pruning of capital expenditure, not recurrent expenditure. Salaries, emoluments, these are recurrent expenditures. Capital Capital expenditures, in the, I'll give you an, an example. It is priority of this government that brought about the second Niger bridge. So, but if you don't invest Excuse in capital expenditure, how do you generate money? How exactly. You, generate you, money? See, you see, you see, you see, you see, exactly. But you you generate, excuse me, excuse me. You generate money because what the, the, the task before us today is to generate money using, you know, investments, attracting investments into the economy. And by this, you can see what this government has done. 
right. Number one, excuse me, number one, you had the free trade zone in Lagos, which was a vision of Aswaji Ahmed Tinubu. And that free, zone, free trade zone in Lagos today is emerging as the hub of African investment. The Dangote investment alone is the largest single investment in the whole of Africa. And I'm saying this because when this government came into power, the initial idea was that the president wanted to establish refineries by the side of... I'm sorry, we have to right. interject. That is the problem, problem I have with sorry, you. Sorry, it's time. That's the problem it's, I have it's time. We are running with time. I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's just give you one minute for your final thoughts. Well, my final thought is that uh, having looked at all these candidates and having looked at the antecedents you know, of all of them and taking a cursory look at the way the foreign exchange is skyrocketing, food, food items are skyrocketing, Nigerians know who has given them a good life. So I will suggest, I will call on Nigerians to go back to those people who would, have given them Would the PDP good have performed differently <laughs> if it was faced with the global challenges? It would have been a worse situation. So, well, that's just a good solution there. So, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a food for thought. That's a food for thought. That's a food for thought. Thank you so much for joining us on Daybreak. You know, for the uh, it's presidency. been quite an interesting discussion. I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, we have to go. Uh, that's our show for today, uh, viewers. Uh, join us again tomorrow for another time on the program. In case you have missed this time around, you can watch all that we've done uh, on our social media platforms. You'll find the link somewhere. We're always streaming live on YouTube, so it's a good place to watch us uh, 247. Thank you for watching. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thank you for welcoming us into your homes this morning. Do, say, uh, do well to join us same time, same station tomorrow. My name is Stella Iyaji. For now, do have a very pleasant day.